So, hello everyone. <laughs> I'm Ray. I'm Rivera. I'm one of the second year uh, infectious disease fellow at USF for whoever doesn't know me. Hey guys. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be talking in this afternoon about uh, MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and I'm going to start talking about the first case that was uh, reported of MERS. Um, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So on June of 2012, a 60 year old male went to the hospital with a seven day history of fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, and the patient was obese and had a Blood pressure, uh, 140 or 80, a um, little bit tacky, um, fevers, breathing at 20 breaths per minute. And um, when the patient presented, it took one day for the patient to be transferred to the ICU um, where he was intubated and um, was uh, placed on mechanical ventilation. Um, a was the chest x ray. Of um, first day of admission, um, we have uh, multiple uh, patchy opacity from the mid to the lower lobe. Um, and B was day two of admission. So went a progression, uh, getting worse. C was a CAT scan uh, four days after admission that showed some metastinal um, hyalur adenopathy and some uh, ground glass opacities. Um, after, during the, the um, third day of admission, uh, his creatinine started to go up in his BUN. Um, and about the eighth day after admission, he, his white cell count started rising, which peaked at 23,800 uh, cells. Um, he also had neutrophilia, neutrophilia and lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia. Um, his O2 sats were in between 78 and 98. Um, percent and on day 11 after the admission the patient died of progressive respiratory and renal failure basically ARDS. So when they took sputum from this patient on, on admission um, they sent the sputum for culture and, and different studies and actually two bacteria grew from this sputum culture grew staph and Klebsiella pneumonia which were sensitive the Klebsiella was sensitive to carbapenems and he was al already on Sosin, but he did not respond at all. Um, that's from the New England Journal of Medicine, that's the uh, data of the patient from admission to the uh, day he died, how his white count went up, his lymph nodes, uh, sorry, uh, lymphocytes remain um, low, and his creatinine was progressively getting worse until um, he died. So his sputum the first day was negative. They did our RBP. They they check um, sorry for immunofor immunofluorescence as I say for LISA and influenza A and B, parainfluenza and RSB and adenovirus and they were all negative. Now they took the sputum and culture it on two types of cells, one LLC MK2 and barrel cells, and they saw that something was growing. Um, in those cells. So they took those cells and you know they were like why you know, there's something growing in the, in, the, in the cells. So they took and they took the cells from the culture and they repeat again the test for the immunofluorescence and it was negative. They did our, our PCR for those two and they were negative too. So they order our PCR of pan uh, coronavirus and some segments came back consistent with a beta coronavirus. Um, so they took those segments and they compared it you know with a data bank of, of genes and saw that they had a new um, virus uh, causing disease in this patient. Um, so they used this reference gene bank um, and discovers the uh, human coronavirus EM EMC that stands for Erasmus Medical Center. Um, basically, coronavirus are enveloped single stranded positive sense RNA viruses that are uh, phenotypically and genotypically diverse. And they're, wi they're basically widespread in, in bats and dogs, cats, they're pretty much 
in all different uh, animals and, and they can also cause infection in humans. Um, like I mentioned, they can be found in birds, cat dogs, pigs, uh, and they have a they have a infidelity of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and a high frequency of RNA recombination and large genomes of RNA viruses and this helps the virus to mutate in a lab. Um, there's an example where I read one of the one of the articles that said that in the 60s they only knew two human coronavirus uh, that can cause infection and now we have six. Um, MERS belongs to a uh, beta beta group of coronavirus, which is divided in four groups, and it's the SARS virus uh, that caused the uh, deaths in 2003 belongs to the same group, but a uh, but a different uh, category. Uh, this is a picture of the structure of the coronavirus, and there's two things here that are important. Um, in, in regards to uh, pathogenesis. The spike protein, uh, it's the, it facilitates uh, the infection to cells in, in the body, and I will explain later how. Um, and the envelope protein E, the gene sequence that, in, that encodes that uh, protein, it's the one that is used to actually identify it in the R PCR. There's more, but that's one of them of them. Um, so, okay, so like I was explaining, um, it's different from other human uh, beta coronavirus, and it, it, the beta coronavirus is divided in four groups, A, B, C, and D. And uh, Mer uh, MERS belongs to uh, group C, which never had any uh, human coronavirus from that group. Um, so that's the phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic tree of the the coronavirus, and if you see in the beta side, SARS belongs to the group uh, B, and there's a hum human coronavirus EMC, which is MERS, uh, just ar arise from this group that it's a C, and there's two in the A. Um, everything that starts with H are, excuse me, viruses that can cause infection in humans. So, as of May of 2012, or 2014, sorry, uh, there's 538 confirmed cases of merits in 16 countries. That's a list of countries that's from the CDC website. Uh, and 145 people dead. Uh, I don't think I'm, an, I'm not including their, the last two that, the, that were uh, diagnosed here in the States. That's uh, a map where actually it arises in Saudi Arabia, but um, it shows where infection has occurred. So you, the United States is not there because infection did not occur in, in the States. It was somebody who was moved from Saudi Arabia um, to to the States. Um, and uh, there's Philippines. The Philippines has had cases. Um, Greece has had cases. Um, Egypt, but they're not in the map just because the infection was originated somewhere else. Um, and MERS have been reportedly found in many bad families. Uh, and um, there's human to human transmission, but there's little known about transmission. So they are pretty, uh, pretty safe when it comes to handling anything that it's contaminated with the virus. And um, there's serologic evidence that suggests that the virus is widespread in camel populations throughout the region. And there's two studies, one from the emergent, uh, emergent infectious disease and when they, they f uh, had a patient who worked at a slaughterhouse uh, and when they had camels and they checked the camel, the camel with a PCR test and they actually, out of 110 camels, they checked three camels, and they, out of 110, three were positive. I'm sorry, and one of them had a only a single nucleotide difference between the infected patient and the camel. 
uh, they did serology tests on 54 of 110 and found that uh, out of 110, 54 had positive antibodies for uh, MERS. And um, none of the persons who worked at the slaughterhouse had positive antibodies at all. And the, the camels, most of the camels were um, brought from different countries. So this is a comparison between SARS and MERS. And the reason why I put this here is because that DPP4, which is CD426, uh, it's the molecule on the membrane of the non-ciliary cells from the airway and different parts of, this, of the body that MERS uses to um, using the spike protein to get into the cells. That, that DPP4, it's mostly unchanged between species. So that's the reason why MERS is it's capable of cause, causing disease in many different animals just because that protein it's, it's, it's has not changed in between species. And like ch uh, SARS used the ACE2 which is only found in the CBN cats and uh, so that's why SARS was way more easy to control because it only has one intermediate host and difference with uh, MERS who can f be found in bats and camels. Uh, the other thing about the DPP4 is that it attracts neutrophils and monocytes, so it might be a inflammatory, uh, it may start inflammatory uh, reaction when, when uh, MERS uh, attaches to it. Um, there is an observational study who was po that was published in uh, Lancet Infectious Disease with 47 patients, and they found that the median age between the patients that were infected was 52, and then 62% of the cases were male. And the median incubation period was 5.2 days, but uh, they found people who had incubation periods from 2 to 14 days. Uh, and the most common symptoms at presentation were fever, uh, fever with chills and rigors, cough, shortness of breath, and myalgias. And some people have GI symptoms, including diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And this is a list of the most common uh, symptoms from that study, fever being the highest, and cough, um, hemoptysis, shortness of breath. So, it's really unclear if persons with specific conditions are disproportionately infected with MERS-CoV or have more severe disease. It's been published that people who have diabetes and hypertension and comorbidities can uh, be, have higher chances of developing severe disease. But the study that was done was done in a dialysis center, so pretty much the people that were there had comorbidities already, so it's hard to say. Uh, but from the people no, that they, they did the study, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiac disease and chronic kidney disease were the most common comorbidities found on infected patients with mers -CoV. And that's uh, a list of the most common comorbidities, uh, diabetes and chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and chronic heart disease. Um, most of the patients have been severely ill with pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS and had acute kidney injury, which I mentioned, have required mechanical ventilation. Usually the median time from presentation to intubation or mechanical ventilation is seven days and to death is 14 days. Uh, this is the, from the same study where they show most uh, common laboratory results. They all the column on the right, it's from s so the SARS outbreak. The one on the left is from the MERS. And it shows that 100% of the people had uh, chest ray abnormalities. And lymphopenia and leukopenia were also common. Imaging and x ray, it's pretty much could be anything. Um, 
people had from bronchovascular markings, uh, airspace opacities, patchy infiltrates, uh, consolidations, nodal opacities. There was there was no specific chest X-ray finding that will say that you know say that the patient had MERS um, infection. And that's um, a example of a different uh, type of uh, X-ray findings. And like B, there's only a con you know a consolidation. There's airspace opacities, ground glass, like in the CAT scan. They uh, they did they inf they study that inf infected uh, some uh, monkeys with the virus and they euthanized the monkeys after the sixth day of infection and they wanted to see the pathology of the lungs and pretty much it was um, the a pneumonia was comp compatible with acute interstitial pneumonia and the virus replication occurred mainly in the lungs in type 1 and, and 2 alveolar pneumocytes. Um, so diagnosis, how do we diagnose? So the recommendations, there's not a lot of that data, but the recommendations is to one, uh, try to uh, collect specimens from different sites at different times. Um, it's recommended that if you're able to get a lower respiratory uh, tract uh, specimen, uh, it will be better than an asophanin heal specimen just because it has higher sensitivities. Um, and there's a study that they did and, they sh and it showed that in one patient they put a graph between time and viral load and they saw that the earlier um, they measured the viral load, the higher uh, was the viral load from the lower respiratory tract. Um, also, urine and blood and feces were positive in some uh, PCRs, but the, the amount of virus that they were able to detect on feces and urine was uh, almost at the limit where the PCR is able to detect. Um, again, I repeat already that, you know, viral loads are higher in lower respiratory tract specimens compared to nasopharyngeal and otopharyngeal samples. And this is the table I was talking about. Um, you see that uh, they're higher with you know, the beginning, day 11, day 12, um, from lower respiratory tract uh, uh, specimens than uh, as we you go further um, during the hospital stay. The CDC recommends um, lower respiratory tract specimens should be the first priority for collection and PCR uh, because it's more sensitive for detection than upper respiratory tract infection. If you have a high index of, you know, you think the patient uh, it's, it's suspicious for infection and you have negative uh, uh, sp specimen, you should repeat it again or try different uh, specimens, either urine or feces. Um, there are three uh, RT-PCRs, the SACE routine for detection of MERS-CoV, they have been developed. And there's also serology uh, for MERS-CoV an uh, antibodies with immunofluorescence and protein microassay. The CDC uh, has developed a two-stage approach. They still prefer to do our PCR, but you can also do this for screening. Um, So this is a, uh, these are the fragments that are specific for the PCR uh, screening test. Um, OP E and ORP, ORF 1B are the, the most important. Uh, okay, so who do we check? Basically it's, they divided, this is from the CDC, they divided on their pa patients on their investigation and confirm and probable cases. So anybody on their investigation is, Somebody with a fever or pneumonia, or ARDS, and has traveled within you know the area for 14 days before the onset of symptoms. Remember that the uh, time it takes to develop symptoms is two, two to 14 days. Or had close contact to anybody who traveled to the area, um, or it's a member of the family from the from the for the uh, from the patient. 
uh, or any close con contact to any confirmed or probable, uh, probable MERS case when the patient was ill. Um, a confirmed case is somebody with symptoms who who has a positive test and a probable cause is somebody who is a patient under investigation but for some reason uh, lab laboratory results are inconclusive or absent um, or the patient has symptoms and it was a close contact uh, from a laboratory confirmed uh, infection. There are, the CDC has guidelines on how to handle uh, specimens when uh, you suspect a, a case. They're pretty detailed, they, they tell you everything, how to how to process the specimen, how to take it to the lab, or what temperature you have to keep and how to uh, transfer the specimen to the CDC. Um, and there's a couple of things that are in, uh, common to all the specimens they, uh, they talk about in the guidelines. Um, one of the things is that you should, as soon as your collection, as soon as you can, send the, the specimen to the CDC. And if, you know, if there's going to be a delay of more than 40 hours um, in the lab receiving the specimens, they should be frozen, preferably at 80 degrees, minus 80 degrees Celsius and cheap in dry ice. Or if it's serum, um, you should separate serum from whole blood and can be stored and cheap at four uh, Celsius or, or frozen to less, uh, minus 20 Celsius or lower and ship in dry eye, on dry eyes. So this is from the guidelines. Uh, basically, it tells you like you get the respiratory specimens when you have you know high incident, high suspicious of an infection, and you have to test um, the specimen for RBP, influenza A. Influenza B, RSB, human methanovirus, but influenza, all the common tests that we do to rule them out, and if they're negative, then you should prepare, it, it gives you details of how to do it, and if you see on the top, there's a phone number where you should call if you have any questions about how to handle a chip, uh, uh, the, the specimen. Um, there's no treatment, there's, in in humans, there's no antiviral agents. Right now, they're not recommended, and there's one observational study in which they give five patients rivalirin and interferon alpha, and they all die. <laughs> but they get they but because it's it's they've done studies on on vivo in which they put low doses of interferon and rivavirin and they were able to stop the virus replication in cells. And there's another one in monkeys in which they give the interferon and the rivavirin early um, and they cure the, the, the monkeys. The difference between the monkey study and the patients is that they wait 14 days for to give the patients the medication. In contrast to the one they did with animals where they give them, they gave them to the animals right away. And they measure the viral load and the inflammatory markers on those monkeys, and they uh, notice that they were lower whenever you treat them earlier, and their viral replication was even lower. So who knows if they would have done that with patients in the beginning? They probably would have cured them, but for now we don't know yet if they work or not. Um, again, the CDC recommends standard contact and airborne precautions for the management of hospitalized patients with known or suspected mers infection. And you should, you know, recommend that individuals that, you know, the World Health Organization recommend that individuals at high risk of severe disease, such as immunocompromised hosts and those with diabetes, chronic lung disease, or pre-existing renal failure, take precaution with visiting farms, camel pens, or market environments where camels are present. So camels are the thing. There's a couple vaccines, uh, candidates on their study. Um, one of them, well, I, um, most of them are are made to uh, attack the protein spike, the one that actually causes the uh, insertion of the virus that binds to the CD26. Uh, this is uh, 
travel precautions from the Ministry of Health Saudi Arabia recommending people that um, if they if you're planning to travel to Saudi Arabia and you have any of these conditions you should not travel these are my reference that's it